So I want to do um, <clears throat> another example. And I'm basically doing the more challenging uh, type of problems here. Um, then I want to say a couple of things and then we'll start on Kirchhoff's Laws, which is a, uh, an important part of the chapter. So let's look at this example again. Let's look at this picture. We're given this circuit and, and, and then um, all I want to do is determine the current through the ammeter. And it looks kind of complicated. And actually it is. I wouldn't wire something that way. But this is an example to help you understand how to analyze circuits. Now think about it. How, what is the current through the ammeter? Let me redraw the circuit. And I want to label something. So we have a 100 watt volt power supply. I'm going to have one side grounded. And I'm going to be lazy. I'm just going to write the, the supply like that. And let me put in the three resistors. And if I get to check, you guys can all hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, good. I forgot to check that. I just want to make sure. I'm I'm talking to someone who can hear me. Um, these are one kilo ohm resistor. And I'm gonna connect the wire between these two resistors. This is just a wire. So I'm actually shorting them. And then the ammeter, it's interesting, the ammeter is gonna be like this. So I want to find the current through this ammeter. Let me write some things down. I want to write down what is the potential at different points. So this point is connected at this point. So this has got to be at 100 volts. Now, the ammeter it has no resistance. It's the same thing as if I did this with the wire. So it's true then that this is 100 volts. This guy, this, this wire goes from here to here. Remember, we're ignoring the resistance of the wire. And so this point and this point are, are the same. They're at zero volts. I've shorted this out. This is also at zero volts. So what do you see? I, you see that this resistor has a 100 volt drop. This resistor has a 100 volt drop. And that resistor has a 100 volt drop. So I have three resistors in parallel. So I'll, let me redraw it. Now the next question is, where's the meter? Well, it's between the second and third one on like either side, right? Or no, on the left side. So, I mean, there's a power supply. Oh, actually, oh. No, you have to draw another line, don't you? Yeah, I haven't drawn the meter. I, I want to put the meter in here. Well, it would go from the battery to the, the, between the top and the second one, or the, the to top and the middle one. This one? No, above that. Up here? So the current comes yeah. in here and splits, right? Some of it goes this way, and then the rest goes to the other two, which splits.
This is the measuring the current after the first resistor, isn't it? Because some of the current is going to go this way, and some of it is going to go this way. So, right, so you have the current going this way, going through your circuit. You get to this point, you have some of the current going this way, and a small amount going this way. So, um, in fact, the majority of the current is going to go through here. That's why I'm saying it's, it's going to be here. Because this is where you get the initial split, right? The current comes in, some go split this way, and some of it get split this way. So that end meter is really over here. Well, how much current? Well, how much current is through this one? You have a hundred divided by a thousand. What's 100 divided by 1,000? 100 milliamp. 100 milliamps. And you have 100 milliamps here. And you have 100 milliamps here. And of course, here you have to have 300 milliamps. So you have 300 going this way, 100 goes this way, 200 goes that way. That's what happens. Because the current, the current goes through, when the current reaches this point, some of it splits off in this direction through the first resistor, and the rest goes through the other two. This, the, the current that goes through here splits into these two directions. Okay? That's a harder problem. Which you normally don't, you don't encounter too often. In real life, you don't see a pro system like that. Okay. I, I want to talk a little bit about internal resistance. I want to look at the, because we talked about this in, ch in, the, in the previous chapter, but we really didn't do any problems. But I want to look at the effect of the internal resistance of a power supply. Now, in, in a power supply, not a battery, that little r is, is small. And, and again, there's not an actual resistor in in the power supply, we draw the R there to represent the effect, the overall effect of, of the power supply on the circuit. It acts as if there's another resistor in the circuit. And it's always in series with the rest of the circuit. And as a result, the voltage that's applied to the load is really lower than the power supply voltage because what happens is when you have two resistors in series the voltage gets divided amongst the two resistor anytime you see two resistors in series folks will call it a voltage divider circuit so the question is what is the effect and what should the relationship what should the relationship between little r and big r be so that I get maximum energy transferred to the load. If I want to maximize energy to the load, what, what, what uh, should the relationship between little r and big r be? So let's look at those questions. So this is actually, this sounds like a complicated thing when you start talking about internal resistance, but it's two resistors in series. It's, a, it's, it's called a voltage divider circuit. So let's analyze this. A lot of times when we draw the power supply, we don't draw the internal resistance, but it should always be there. Like I said, on a real power supply, this is so small, you don't notice the effect. But in a battery, this, this gets bigger and bigger as the battery gets older. And if this is too big, you're not going to get enough energy delivered to the load, like a light bulb. And then you have to replace the battery. And so symbolically, we draw the entire power supply with a box over it that includes the internal resistance. So, what's the current through the circuit? Well, that's easy because it's going to be the power supply voltage, the EMF. This is what the, what, what the, the voltage is listed on the battery. So, if you get a 9-volt battery, that's the EMF. So, I is going to be the EMF divided by the total resistance. 
the voltage across the load is going to be this current times that resistance. And as long as this is there, as long as the little r is there, the voltage across the resistor is not going to be the same as the power supply voltage. So as your battery gets worse, this gets bigger, and the voltage across the light bulb, for example, whatever the r is, uh, is going to get smaller. And if it's too small, the, the bulb won't go on. That ha that's what happens, for example, in the flashlight. And so you got to get rid of the battery and replace it. But in a manufactured power supply, this is typically so small that it's not going to affect the circuit. This is, and I should say, this is small compared to the resistance of the rest of the circuit. And, you know, again, an example where you can see this is, you know, you go to your car, you turn on the headlights, and you turn the crank. Now you're drawing a lot of current, and, and, and when you're drawing a lot of current, the R across the, the voltage across the little resistor is going to be big enough so you can actually see the lights dim. That's the effect of the internal resistance. So the question is, if I want to maximize the energy that I deliver to the load, what is the relationship between little r and big r? And this is a lab we've done in the past, which we're not doing this semester. It's actually an easy lab, but you've got to take a lot of data. So I want to write down the equation for power. However we want to write it, we can write power as I squared R or V times I, however you want to do it. I'm going to get the same equation. So I'll write it like this. I multiply these two together, and what do I get? I'm going to get the EMF squared divided by big R plus little r squared times r. I want to find what is the relationship between these two so that I get maximum energy transfer. Okay. So how do I maximize this function? I want to set dp dr equals zero. Okay, so let's take the derivative of this respect. To, and I, I always forget the quotient rule. So what I do is I, I write it like this. So that I can use the product rule, okay? And this E is not even going to play a role, so I'm going to put the E on the other side. So what is that going to give me? If I use the product rule, it's going to give me R plus R to the minus 2 plus negative 2R. Please check my algebra. So now let me write it as a fraction. I will get a common denominator and I will get the following. And I want this to be zero. And all I have to worry about is making the numerator zero. So 
as long as the load resistance is the same as the internal resistance, I get maximum energy transfer to the load. So what is epsilon again? Is that the that's the goal? That's the rated voltage on the, let's say on the battery. It's called the EMF, which is a bad term. Uh, electromotive force, which is really not a force. That's a term that's stuck over the years. But that's the, the, that's the actual battery voltage rate. In it. So, so if you buy a battery from uh, Walgreens, a one and a half volt battery, that's the EMF. Okay. But when you use it to light a flash, flashlight, this is what the flashlight gets. And this is called okay. terminal voltage. This is what the light bulb is actually getting. The EMF is the idealized voltage. Are we okay with that? So where did that go in the equation? I'm sorry? When you took the derivative and pulled it out? This one? Yeah, the epsilon. Oh, I forgot what I, I forgot the E. I'm sorry. You know why I forgot it? It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't play a role in this problem, so I, I that's why I forgot it. Sorry about that. That answer is confusing though, because wouldn't it make sense if the internal resistance was as low as possible? You want it to be zero, right? Yeah, it is kind of weird. But then if, if the, internal is... the internal resistance is low, then the, the load resistance has to be... Oh, higher for the same power. Okay, that makes sense. And one can like ask the same thing when we talk about AC circuits, but we don't talk about it in terms of resistance. We talk about it in terms of uh, uh, something called the impedance. But the analysis is a little bit more complicated to, to actually do that proof. Okay, so we proved this, we, we proved this already. By the way, anytime in a physics problem, um, you're asked to maximize something, you know, you might have to take a derivative, it just depends. In some cases, it's easy. You can, see, you can see the answer right away, but in this one, it's hard to see, so you have to take a derivative. Some people forget that. Okay, so anyway, I talked about that example. So, um, and we might, somebody might have brought this up last week. How are devices connected in the home? How are, how are things connected in your house? Series or parallel? Parallel, right? They have to be parallel. Can you imagine your air conditioner being connected in parallel to the, the lights in your house? Every time you put a resistor in your circuit, you reduce the, uh, the current. I mean, you saw what happened with the three light bulbs, right? When I hooked them up in series as compared to parallel. That 200 watt bulb in series didn't even go on. I mean, it was on, but it didn't glow. So everything in the home is connected in parallel. It has to be. Because otherwise all the lights in your homes would be very dim. You save on your power bill. Yeah, you would. <laughs> um, what about the circuit breaker? In the old days, I would say fuse, but uh, what about the circuit breaker? How, how is the circuit breaker uh, hooked up in your house? Oh, it would have to be in series because then it would break the circuit. When right, yeah. You, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? When it, if it needed to be tripped, then it would cut the circuit. If it, if it was in parallel, it, wouldn't, it would only cut like one device or whatever it was connected to. Correct. So, so yeah, uh, your circuit breakers in your homes are connected in, uh, um, in series. So I don't know if any, any homes use fuses. They used to have, in the old days, it would be a fuse you would just screw into a little socket, like a light bulb. Uh, but I think those are gone. 
The problem with the fuses is once, you, when the, once the fuse goes bad, you have to actually replace it. Circuit breakers are not like that. Um, yeah, so, so um, and that's to prevent you from, from drawing too much current in your wires because your wires are rated to a certain current. If you put too much current in a wire, the wire will get hot and it can start melting and it can start a fire. And that was a problem a long time ago. In fact, what some people would do in the old days with the fuse boxes, you can't do that now. They didn't like fuse box. They didn't like putting fuse in, so they'd take a penny and put it in the socket. And guess what happened when they drew too much current? They would you know, get a fire. Our home would go on fire. So that's why we, that's another reason why using the circuit breaker is better. What's the purpose of the grounding prog on an outlet in your house? To not cause a short in a wire? Yeah, in the, in the old days, and this was, again, it was another problem. You know, let's say your washing machine didn't have a ground on it. And suppose um, something got shorted to your, let's say, the, the body of the, the washer and you touched it. Guess what would happen to you? You'd die. <laughs> yeah, because, and you, you know, washing machine, you're standing by water, right? So you, you can get killed from that. And so what, what they decided is like, let's add a third prong and let's ground, let's, let's hit, which we call the ground, and we will ground the, the body of, let's say, the washing machine. So if, if there is a short uh, to the body, which is grounded, if you touch it, you have a higher resistance, everything will go straight to ground. But there, there was a time where, you know, the appliances didn't have that grounding prong. So we've talked about this. What happens to the internal resistance of the batteries that ages? It gets it gets bigger. So, but and I ask these questions because you know what we what we're talking about here. I mean, has applications in, in everyday life. You know, one of the things uh, too, and I should ask this question. You know, when you when you have your plugs in your house, you know they're connected to a circuit breaker. Let's say let's say twenty amps. You can't plug in anything into those into those outlets. Okay, you, can, you know, for example, if you have an old vacuum cleaner, if you have two old vacuum cleaners, and you turn them on at the same, you plug them in and you turn them on at the same time, you're, gonna, you're going to trip the circuit breaker. So if you're using a heavy-duty appliance in an outlet, you've got to make sure, you got to think about what you, what's going to happen when you plug in a second appliance into that outlet. That's why things like, you know, uh, microwaves have their own uh, circuit breaker and their own plug isolated because you don't want to plug anything else into it because you'll blow the, you blow the circuit breaker. I keep wanting to say fuse, but you'll, you'll blow the circuit breaker, okay? So there's a lot of pr practical um, applications of these ideas in the home. So you learn how to wire in this class and in Engineering 17, you could do some common things in your house. Um, the only thing you, you, you won't know are the laws as to how things should be wired in terms of uh, wiring code. But, I mean, you can do a lot of things. You can re easily replace a switch in your home. Um, um, you can rewire things in your house. Of course, you've got to make sure you're doing everything up to code. Okay. You know, you can do little jobs, but any, anything that involves a big job, you'd have to probably still hire an electrician because you've got to do things to code. So let's look at this circuit. Uh, this circuit has two power supplies in it, and I want to calculate the current in this circuit. And this is one of those examples where I actually have to use Kirchhoff's laws. In fact, this is a simple example where I have to use the, the loop rule that I talked about earlier. So let's go through this example. It's not a complicated example. But it's indicative of the kind of problems we're going to be doing soon. So Kirchhoff's um, 
Voltage law says that the sum of the voltage drops around a loop is zero. So let me draw a picture of my circuit. So the first re resistor is 5,000 ohms. I should have chosen better numbers. And then the other battery is hooked up backwards. I'm going to assume that the current in my circuit will go clockwise. Okay, I'm going to assume clockwise current. You could do it either way though, technically, right? Technically, yeah, I could do it either way. And if I'm wrong, guess what happens? It's just negative. Yeah, I just get a sign error. It doesn't matter. And, you, know, I don't, you, know, you might not know ahead of time what, what it should be. So uh, you, you always guess. And if you apply the physics correctly, then you will be told at the end of the problem, oh, you chose the direction wrong. But that's okay. I mean, you had, you had no idea what it would have been in the first place. And you do the same thing in physics 205 when you do the torque problems. When you do the torque problems in 205, when you sum torques, you had to assume a direction for a force. And if you were wrong, so what? At least you were able to get the magnitude of the force. The minus sign tells you you chose the wrong direction. You had no way of knowing what it would have been ahead of time. So let's assume clockwise. And let me write down these voltages. I forgot. Uh, 9 volts. And this one is 1.5 one volts. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go around in a circle, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go clockwise also. I can do a clockwise or counterclockwise, but I'm going to sum the delta Vs in the clockwise direction. And for any loop, it's got to be zero because the integral of E dot ds is zero in a closed path. Because the electric field is conservative. And, and if I multiply it by, by Q, it tells me energy is conserved. Okay, so let's pretend this is zero volts. I can't say that that's zero volts. So let's, they go from, or I can just say, this goes from a lower to a higher voltage. So the voltage, if I, if I go to the left here, and I look at the voltage change between this side and this side, the voltage goes up by nine volts. So I have, a positive, uh, an increase in the potential, but then on this one, the 5,000 ohm resistor, I is in that direction. Remember that J is sigma times E. I is in the direction of the electric field. And if I'm summing this way, if I'm going in that direction, then I'm going from a higher potential to a lower potential. So this decreases. So I'm going to have a voltage drop. And I know that the current through here and the current through here are the same because I only have one loop here. And again, when I get to this resistor, I'm summing clockwise that I'm saying the current goes that way and I'm summing in the same direction so I'm going in the direction of the electric field the potential decreases and then when I reach this battery I go from a lower potential to a higher potential so then I get E1 plus E2 equals and I'm going to do the math quickly. So I is E1 plus E2 over 7,500. That's it. So that's how you would apply Kirchhoff's loop rule to a problem like this.
So That's problems true. that are more complicated, you want, you're going to start wanting to use Kirchhoff's law because it always works. Okay. Series and parallel rules only work for series and parallel circuits. Are we okay with this? Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, shouldn't it be 10.5? Did I add wrong? Uh, oh, yeah, just... 9 and 1 and a half oh, is 10 yeah. and a half. Thank you. Let me recalculate that. I don't know why I did 10. Oops. Oh, it's 14 milliamps. Maybe that's why I chose that number. Okay, sorry about that. I can't add, I guess. All right. Thank, thank you. So this is a prelude to what, what we're going to be about to do. Take a look at this circuit. It's essentially the Wheatstone Bridge, but I put a resistor where the ammeter was. Now what? Neither series nor parallel. What do I do? Well, this is an example where I have to apply Kirchhoff's laws. I will do a simple one and then I'll do a more complicated one. I'll do this one in a minute. Okay, so, so now we're going to do problems where we have to apply Kirchhoff's law. By the way, um, you're learning this. This technique always works for any kind of circuit. But it might not be worth it if, if you have just a series parallel circuit. Okay. Only use this method when you need to use it. When you take Engineering 17, you will learn techniques that are based on Kirchhoff's laws. Oops. Sorry, my phone my phone's going crazy. Um, so when you take Engineering 17, those of you who are going to take it. You're going to basically learn tricks that are based on Kirchhoff's laws, which will make problem solving a little bit easier. So basically what we're going to be doing is doing solving problems using Kirchhoff's law by brute force without using the tricks. Okay. And then engineering 17, you'll learn all the tricks that are, they, some, there are shortcuts to make the problems a little bit easier to solve. And I have some extra uh, slides in here that I'm not showing for you for notes. And by the way, um, I do email the PowerPoint notes instead of putting them on Canvas just because of issues I have regarding with the online courses. So um, uh, please check your emails. Check your check the e not only on Canvas but uh, check your uh, any uh, any other email address you have because because some of the emails I sent I sent through my uh, Sierra College email not through Canvas. Okay. Oops. So to use Kirchhoff's law, we gotta, actually got to use the, the loop rule and the um, current rule. And there is a textbook, really, which I prefer uh, that, uh, in terms of how they teach it, but uh, we're not using it. Um, there's a, a textbook by Young and Friedman. Let me... And maybe you can find something online. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but. Young and Friedman. They, uh, it's called University Physics. And it's in chapter 25. I, I, I think they have the best, uh, they, they have the best way of, of teaching people how to, how to apply this idea uh, out of all the books. Some, um, when I learned it, I learned it in a more cumbersome way. Um, what they do, they make, they make like a lot easier for you. So I'm going to use that method. The method is based on what's in Young and Friedman's book. Okay. And it doesn't matter what edition. So we're going to use 
Kirchhoff's rules, or laws, whatever, however you want to uh, describe them. So number one, you're going to be looking at the sum of the voltage drop around the loop to be zero. And you're going to use the junction rule. And in fact, what will happen is we're going to apply the junction rule right away. You apply the junction rule right away and then apply um, the loop rule. And you use as many loops as you need to solve the problem. The number of loops you need depends on how many independent currents you have. So here's the methodology. Look, you guys got to draw. One of the things that um, about solving problems in, in physics, you always got to learn how to draw a picture. You, gotta get, you have to get in the habit of it. Drawing a picture that's really teeny weeny that that's, you, know, you can't see is not going to help you with these problems. You want to draw a nice big picture, big enough so you can write stuff in the figure. You can write words in the figure. So you want to draw a nice big schematic diagram. Big, like I said, big enough so you can write things in it and it's clear to read. The more complicated the circuit, the bigger the picture. Then you got to take a loop. Actually, I, I shouldn't say that. You actually have to apply. I don't know what happened. To, there's one part missing. You want to apply the current rule right away. And I'll show you an example. And then choose a loop and pick directions to sum delta Vs. Okay. Basically, choose loops until you have as many equations as unknown. So there, for some reason, one of mine disappeared in here. But the, the number two should be apply the current rule right away. Then do number, what's number two that's listed here. And then solve system, solve the equations simultaneously. So the more complicated a circuit is, the more equations you're going to have. There are cases where you can do six equations and six unknowns. Which you'll encounter in uh, the circuits class in engineering. Uh, you're not going to see uh, an, a problem with six equations and six unknowns in my class. Um, you're, you're, probably, you're probably only going to go up to three equations and three unknowns. But really, that's about it. I, I don't think, at least at this point, it's necessary to do such complicated problems. But the idea is the same. On an exam, um, I'm going to want you to solve the problems by hand, so you're not going to see a very complicated circuit. I'm really looking at, can you apply the idea? So the math shouldn't be that hard. When you take 17, he's going to have you use the calculator. You're going to set up the equation, then the calculator will give you the answer. So I want to apply the rules to this circuit. So here's the, here's the, the, the circuit, so I'm going to draw it. This is something you would see in your car, so it's applied to the car. So let me draw the circuit, and then let me apply the rules. And stop me if you get lost somewhere. And, you know, the, the idea is not hard. What's hard is keeping track of signs, okay? The hard part is keeping track of what's positive, what's negative. But otherwise, these are not really that difficult a problem, other than maybe having to do some tedious algebra. So this power supply voltage is 14 volts. So I come up to here, and we have another battery, uh, not, I mean, I'm sorry, another resistor, and it's also, oh, this is 0.1 ohm, sorry. And it's 12 volts. And let's see, the last one is, it's the 1.2 volt battery, uh, volts. 1.2 ohms, sorry. This is 12 volts. And 
and let me label points F, E, and D. What can you say about points F, E, and D? They have the same potential? Correct. So V sub D equals V sub E equals V sub F. Actually, I can say it the same about these points, right? Aren't they the same? Well, no, because there's a battery on, aren't there? On two different, in parallel. But there's, those, the, isn't it true that this wire, I'm saying about the voltage, not the current. Yeah. I mean, these have no resistance, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. So A, B, and C really have the same potential difference. I'm sorry, potential, not potential difference. Okay. That's just because there's not a resistor in between them, basically. I'm sorry? That's just because there's no resistance between them. Cause... Correct. There's no resistance between them, so they're all at the I mean... same potential. All right. So first thing now, now I've drawn my, my, my picture. The first thing I'm going to do is really starting, I'm going to assign currents, and it doesn't matter how I do it. And I want to do it in a manner that's consistent with my notes. Oops. So I'm going to call... Uh, I'm going to say that all the current is here, and then it's going to split up this way and this way. So I'm going to call this I1, and I'm going to call this I2, and this here is I equals I1 plus I2. I've already applied the, the, loop, the current rule. I just look at this junction right there. All the current comes up and splits into two into two ways. You could you can you don't have to choose that convention. That's the interesting thing is that the the convention there's there's you you, you can define your own convention how the currents split. I mean you can you can choose this point and apply the current rule, but you got to apply it at a junction. So you got to apply it either here or here. And you can make the currents go downward and, or whatever. You can make this go downward and this one go downward and that one to the, to the right. It, it doesn't matter. Because if you're wrong, you'll get a minus sign. You'll get a, you'll get a minus sign in your final answer. So that's the convention I'll use. Not sure why it's not advancing. Oh, here we go. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum clockwise, and there's three loops there. I don't know if you noticed, there's three loops there. I'm going to pick two loops. And I'll use green. I'm going to sum clockwise. I like summing in the direction of the chosen current. Well, here is more complicated because this, this loop has two different currents. But I want to stay clockwise in both cases. You can go counterclockwise if that makes you happy. Okay. So I'm going to go around and look at the voltage drops this all the way around here. So what do I get? So let's do the bottom loop. I'm going, to, I'm going to choose this loop and this loop. I can also choose this loop. But I only need two loops because I only have two independent currents. I is dependent on I1 and I2. Right? This one's dependent on the other two. So I1 and I2 are independent. So let's do the bottom loop. And I'm going to go this way. So I go from a lower to higher potential. So I have 14 volts. Let 
Then if I go this way, I, I'm saying that I is going to the left, and so this is going to be a voltage drop. I'm summing, I'm summing voltages in the direction of the current, and so that's going to be a voltage drop. I'm going to write I1 plus I2. I'm not going to write I there because these are the two independent variables. Then what? Then I get to then I get up here and the current. So I go around this way. I'm summing voltage drops in the direction of the current. I'm going in the direction of decreasing potential because the electric field is going to the right. And so I'm going to write minus 0.01 ohms times I1. And then I have the battery. I have a voltage drop here. I go from higher to lower. And I'm done with the loop. So that's my first loop. Then I do my second loop. And my second loop, um, I'll start here and go clockwise. So I'm going to go from a lower to higher potential. Uh-oh. I'm going against the direction of the current. The electric field is pointing to the right. I'm summing to the left. So I'm going against the electric field. I'm going towards the direction of increasing potential. And so that's going to be a plus. So I continue, I reach this resistor. Now, I2 is in the same direction. Uh, the current through I2 here is in the same direction as I'm summing. Voltage drop. So now I have two equations and I have two unknowns. Now I can just solve them. The rest is just uh, algebra. Okay? So now it's just algebra. So maybe I'll reduce, I'll reduce this, this top one a little bit. 14 minus 12 is 2. And then I would combine terms here. Uh, And I'm going to, I guess I shouldn't really write all the units. And what I would do to solve this, I don't I actually, it's, it's a disadvantage to, do, to me to do substitution. I would multiply the bottom equation by 11 and add them. So if I multiply the bottom one by 11 and then add, So 12 times 11 is 132, 132 and 2 is 134. And then multiply this by 11, this ends up being 13.2. I think that's supposed to be 0.1 I2 on the first equation. Not this one? 0. Uh, oh, this is 0.1? Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, one three, so this would be 1.32 plus 0.1 or minus 0.1. And so I2 There's something wrong here.
That number is pretty big. I, I got 9 amps. So I did some weird, something weird with my math. I should get 9.2 is, uh, um, oh. I think that, is that not 14.2? Yes, thank you. Jeez. <laughs> Can't do math today. Okay, now that's going to come out to be uh, nine, around 9.0 amps. Are we okay with that? Barring my, my poor, my poor uh, arithmetic. And then once you get I2, you go back uh, into one of the, these two equations, solve for I1. So um, I1 ends up being 10.1 amps. And then I1 plus I2 is 19.1 amps. And, you know, I, I rounded some of these values off. And then the potential difference between these two points, these two points, and these two points are the same. And then if you wanted to find power, you can, because you, you have everything you need to know now. Are we okay with this? Um, a question. Yeah. So for the second loop, can we like uh, choose the bigger square instead of the upper rectangle? Yeah, as long as you get as long as you get two sets of independent equa equations, that's fine. And yeah, you could use the upper the the, the big square. Got it. Because you have three loops, and you can use any three you want. As long as the 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 equations that you get are independent of each other, right? Because if they're if, if if they're not, you can't solve the problem, right? If the if the if the equations are, are not independent of each other. Other questions? Okay. Now for the fun one. Well, it's the same idea, you know. It's not, it's really, this problem is really the same idea, just that it's a little bit more complicated. And then your notes have actually gone through this problem two different ways. Okay. Uh, and because that you get to see, it's really arbitrary how I can choose my currents. So this is essentially that Wheatstone bridge problem, but except that I, instead of the ammeter, um, I replace it with another resistor. And you're given the resistance values. So let's talk about how to set up the equation. Really the big thing is how do you set up the equations? And the rest is really math. You know, and if, if you're an engineer, once you set up the equations, you're gonna have a, you know, a calculator solve it for you. Okay. Physici physicists will be probably forced to do it by hand, but okay. So let me redraw that picture. So I'm going to have more currents that are independent. I will actually have three. Actually, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to write, it's not gonna be a big picture, unfortunately, because I, I don't have a big board. But I'll try to make it a big picture. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to designate currents. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to start out here. So I'm going to look at the, what's coming from the power supply and it gets to this point and it gets split two different ways. 
Well, if this is I1, this is I2, this has to be I1 plus I2. So uh, right away, I've applied the loop rule. Hold on a second. So I got that one. I have I2. And then I have I1 plus I2. So, so far I have two independent currents. And then when, when you get when you get to the to this point here, the current splits again. Okay, the current splits again. So you can, and this is arbitrary how you want to do it. You can you can call the current through here I3, and it doesn't matter what direction you choose, as long as you choose a direction. So then this is going to be I2 plus I3. And this one's going to be I3 plus I1. So from my picture, I see that I have three independent currents, I1, I2, and I3. Okay. So if you... Oh, if you I'm sorry, I3 three minus... Oh. Sorry, I made a mistake. Just give me a second. Go ahead and say, go ahead. So if you had picked I3 wrong, it just means you guessed the direction wrong. That's it. Yeah, and if, if you, you apply the rules right, and I screwed up at, I screwed up at RC. I, okay, so that's better. All right, you guys see it's I, why it's I1 minus I3? It's based on the direction I chose for I3. And like you said, if I chose I3 in the other direction, if I, if I chose I3 that way, then this would be a plus sign and this would be a minus sign. Does that make sense? So it's your choice. You have no idea what, the, you, you have no idea what that direction is. If I'm wrong, when I solve it, I'll get a minus sign. You're still going to get the same current. Are we okay with that? Once you've done this, I think, I think really once you've done this, the rest of it's pretty straightforward. To me, this is the hardest part of the problem, is figuring out how many independent currents you have. Since you have three independent currents, you need to have, you need to do three loops. You can choose whatever loops you want, but you need to have, I mean, I can choose three loops without a power supply, but you'll find if you do that, one of the loops, uh, two of the loops are going to be dependent on each other. One of the loops you choose has to have, at least one has to have a power supply in it. Because I can do, I can do this loop, I can do this loop, and then this big diamond. And you'll find that the sum of the two triangles is going to give you the diamond. Okay, and so that, so that means you have two of them, they're de dependent on each other. So I'm going to do something different, just for fun. I'm going to choose the upper triangle as one loop, and I will go counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. I'm just being different in this case, in this particular example. Just to show you, it doesn't matter. My second loop will be this one. So let me outline the loops. I'm going to do this one, and then I'm going to do this one. So I'll call this one, this two, and then the third one will be the outside one. You can tell there's a lot of loops in this one and you can choose any ones, but you got to make sure that they're all independent of each other. Okay, so those are my three loops. So let's try to set up equations for each set of loops.
Now let me check my time. Okay. So, let's look at loop one. I'm going counterclockwise, so where should I start? Let me start here. I'm gonna go downward, so if, if I'm summing in the direction of the currents, then the voltage drop across RA will be negative, so it's gonna be a negative drop so it's going to be negative I1 times RA, and RA is 1 ohm. Can I just write? Well, I'll write it like this at first. And, and, and um, I'm not going to be, I, I know I'm being sloppy with the units, it's just list writing for me. Now I get to this resistor, I'm summing another voltage drop. What's R sub E? R sub E is one ohm. And then the last one is R2. So I'm gonna go around this way. I'm going against the direction of the current so that's a voltage gain, because remember, electric field is this way, and I'm going against the electric field. So that's plus R sub B, which is 1 ohm. So really, I can, I, I can write it this way. Now the second loop, let me go back so I can show you the second loop. The second loop con contains the power supply and I'm going clockwise and the first, resist the first resistor has current I1 through it and the second resistor has current I1 minus I3 to it. Okay, so I'll start here. I get a voltage gain. Uh, the power supply is 13 volts. And then what? Uh, then I get to this resistor, I get a voltage drop. And R sub A again is uh, 1 ohm. I won't write it in this time. Well, I'll write it in for now. And then I have the voltage drop on this resistor. Again, it's another drop. This one's I1 minus I3, and R sub C is also 1 ohm. So let me rewrite this. Um, I have two of these. And then I have none of these, and I have an I3. And I'm going to put plus 13, like that. Okay, so let me go to the next slide real quick, because I've, I've written these equations down. Okay. And then the second loop. And let me do the third loop. The third loop then is going to be this outer one. So again, I'm going to have a plus 13. And then I have R sub B. Okay. And R sub B again, and I got to remember, I keep forgetting their value for the resistances, sorry. R sub B is one ohm, so it's going to be minus 1.0. 
I2. And then again, we're going this way, so I'm going to have another voltage drop. And R sub D is 2 ohms. So let's collect terms. These two give you 3. And then I have a minus 2i3. So those are my three equations, and I have three unknowns. Of course, you can solve these by substitution if you want. Right? If you like doing a lot of work, you can su solve these by substitution. But I would probably prefer a method like the one I used in the last case, where I just multiply one equation by a number and another equation by a second number and add the equations together. That to me is a little bit faster. Okay? So it's a little bit faster if I basically uh, multiply things together. In fact, what I can do, if we look at these equations, I can write, uh, I can write this in an interesting manner. All right, this is zero I2, right? And this is zero I1. I can write this in the following way. Since Basically, all I'm going to be doing to solve these, I'll multiply this by a number and this by a number and add them together and stuff like that. What I can do is write these in a, in a matrix where I just put the coefficients in front of the variables. This is I1, I2, I3. And that's it. So I can write it in this fashion. In fact, I skipped this in your note. Let me, let me, uh, I, I rearrange them to a standard form. might have done a, a, a math there. Hold on a second. Okay. And what you can do to solve this is to uh, basically multiply rows and columns and, and, and add them together, which is the same thing as me. Let's say I, let's say I took uh, this this guy multiplied by 3 and added it to this one, I would eliminate a variable. Right? It's the same thing. You, yeah, this is from linear algebra. This is, to me, a little bit faster. Of course, if you're in a calculator, it's even faster. But, I mean, so there's multiple ways to solve them as opposed to doing substitutions. And so the goal here is to uh, take, take this equation and you manipulate the elements of the matrix until you obtain zeros in their lower left um, of the matrix. You form a staircase of zeros. We call it echelon form. What you can do is you can interchange any two rows. It's just like in interchanging equations. You can multiply an equation by a number which I don't know if you noticed. Let me go back. Um, this equation here, I actually multiply through. I'm sorry, not that one. Uh, this one I actually mu multiply through by. Uh, why is there a negative number there?
So there's an error in the signs. Hold on a second, I see a possible error in my signs. Just give me one second. I think on your second equation, it should be plus psi 3. This is the negative sign distributes. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Another silly math there. That's why I notice a different in signs. So I did multiply one of the equations by minus one, so that's why it looks different. I'm going backwards, sorry. I went too far. Sorry about that. Anyway, so I have these equations. Let me go to the relational thing again because they skip in my PowerPoint notes. So the gist of it is the following. You can rearrange the rows and the columns you can rearrange the rows you can multiply or divide a row by a non-zero constant you can add a multiple of one row to another and of course that includes subtracting so just as an example here's the matrix I started with I'm going to take two times row one Okay, so I doubled row one. It's basically, I, I, I multiply the top equation. The first equation I wrote on the board, I, I just doubled it, which is fine. Then I take the top row and add it to the bottom row. Now I'm getting zeros. Then I take twice the second row and add it to three times the third row. And I know I'm going through this fast. So now look at the bottom row. I have negative 13 equals 13. What that represents is the equation that negative 13 I3 equals 13. And so I3 is negative 1. Once I have that, then I can go into the second equation and solve for I2, and then I can go to the top equation and solve for I3. That's it. And so that's row reduction. Okay? And, and if you're not familiar with this, that's fine. I mean, you, can just, you, can, you, can, you can use whatever method you've learned to solve three equations, three unknowns, but this is a little faster. And this is uh, something you learn in linear algebra. You learn how to manipulate matrices. Okay. Now, the minus sign that I got after solving them means I chose the direction of the current incorrectly. So the current is actually in the opposite direction. So I3 really points to the left. And so I2 ends up being 5 amps, and I1 ends up being 6 amps. So this is the circuit showing all the different currents. It should really look like that. And what's coming from the power supply is 11 amps. You have 11 amps. It goes into uh, the, the junction and gets split up into 5 and 6 amps. I3 has 1 amp going to the left. And then at the bottom, you just use I1 minus I3. And then I2 plus I3. So let me show you, compare it to the picture I had drawn. One second. Oops. So here I3 is really that way. And so this current is going to be 6 
amps plus one amps, one amp, and this is going to be um, five amps plus uh, five amps, and then one amp going that way. So that's four amps. Okay. Now, can I do this a different way? The answer is yes, of course. I mean, I, I don't have to choose those conventions. And I'm going to go through this way, this one quickly. I'm going to go to the same circuit, and I'm going to choose different conventions. So let me, let me make this bigger here. Okay, so now I'm going to choose different conventions. I'm just going to just set it up. Um, you can go ahead and solve the problem yourself. So watch how I do this version of the problem. I'm going to designate my currents differently. So I'm going to call my one current R I1. Then I3 in the opposite direction. I'm going to call this I4. And that's I5. I'm going to call this bottom one I4 plus I5. Instead of calling it I1 plus I2. I should get the same result, right? And if you look at the previous problem, I4 plus I5 was the same thing as I1 plus I2. So I can make I3, I4, and I5 the independent currents. And then I1 and I2 will, will be uh, dependent on these guys. which means I1 ends up being I3 plus I4, and I2 is I5 minus I3. So in, in this designation, I'm making 3, 4, and 5 independent, and I1 and I2 dependent. And I'm free to choose that. And I can, I can sum over three loops. There's a first loop which is the, the, one, the same one we used before, but it was a second loop in my other case. I can use the outer loop. And then I chose the, the bottom triangle. The only thing that's different is my independent currents that I've chosen are different. But I should get the same result. So I can set up my equations and I'm going to go through this quickly. You can set up the equations by going through the loops. So, for example, if you do loop one on the previous slide, I will have a 13 volt drop. Then um, I'm going to have RA is one amp. So I'm going to have one amp, uh, I'm sorry, one amp, RA is one ohm. I'm going to have 1 ohm times I3 plus I4. And then I'm going to have minus 1 times I4. This is what I have there. And then I can continue with each loop. This example is just for you guys to look at. I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this uh, different method. So I get these three equations and I solve them. If I solve them, what I'll find, basically, when I solve them, what I'll find is I'll get the same currents as I did before. Does uh, anybody have any questions? And in fact, the notes, I've hidden the notes because usually I just show the setup, but I can show you what you end up getting. Because we have a couple of minutes. So you end up getting those equations. You can use the uh, row reduction and you'll get I3 is minus one amp, I4 is seven amps, and I5 is four amps. That's what we had before. And then you can get you can solve for I, I1, I1 is going to be 7 minus 1. 
and I2 is going to be 4 plus 1. Does anybody have any questions? I thought I added, then I, I thought I, I changed the date. Let me, let me, let me double check. That's wrong class. Um. So October 3rd, which is tomorrow. Okay. So you still have, you have until tomorrow to get it done. By the way, um, for some reason we didn't include the color code for your Ohm's Law Lab, so I, I, I emailed you the color code and I put in, I put in the file in, in the modules tab. So I don't know if you can see that. Okay. All right. I don't want to go too far longer. Um, do you have, before I go, do you have questions regarding what I've said about uh, Kirchhoff's laws? Because I know I did the second version of the example kind of quick. And my point of the second example is this is for you to read through it to see a different way to set up the equations. Because students get, when students do these problems, they think there's only one way to solve them. And there isn't. There's a lot of ways. So on an exam, it's really hard to grade these problems because of the different number of ways you can set the problem up. Okay. So the reason why I put these two, the, I did the same example twice so you can see how you can designate the current two different ways. And, and, and you saw me when I did this problem, especially this particular one. It's very easy to make sign errors. Okay, when I'm up on the board, it's, it's a lot harder when you're doing it on paper. But it's very easy to make sign errors. So just, that's the biggest thing. So the, to me, the two biggest keys in this pro, these type of problems is one, correctly setting up your, your current. So uh, apply the current rule right away. And then the next thing is making sure you don't make an algebra error or making sure you don't make a sign error. Those are the two difficult things about these problems. Otherwise, the rest is pretty straightforward. At least I think so. I think once you, once you do a couple of these, you'll see that these problems aren't that bad. It just those two things, designating currents and not making a, a silly error in, in signs. Okay. Questions? Or concerns? So next week, I will do RC circuits to finish off the chapter. And really for you guys, you actually have extra time to study for this unit because I'm, I'm, I'm essentially almost done. I just got to do RC circuits. And so next week, I'm going to start magnetism. And like I said, I, we need to be ahead by at least one week until we get to um, Thanksgiving. Okay? We need to be a week ahead until we get to Thanksgiving because we, don't, we miss a Friday. That's like missing two lectures for my other class. But I think that does give you extra time to study the material for an exam. So no more questions, concerns. I just want to make sure that what I, if I, did I cover it too fast or? Makes sense to me. Okay. I guess, I guess you'll, see, you'll see when you start uh, working on the homework problem, right? Okay. So I guess that's it. It, it, it does, you're, you're right, Dan. It does seem easier than Unit 1. It, and, um, again, the only thing is, you know, for this one is just sign. They're not big errors, right? They're all small errors, but they're annoying because they're, they're, the errors you can make are very hard to track in these kind of problems. All right, so that's it. Uh, you, you folks have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday for lab. Um, 
So I will, I will use the time in the lab to answer questions on homework five. Okay. All right. Have a good weekend.